Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. everybody welcome to today's virtual commonwealth club program i am john oliver host of um last week tonight with me uh it is my pleasure to introduce Saddam sangera award-winning journalist and best-selling author of empire land how imperialism has shaped modern britain empire land is Satnam's third book and it was named uh book of the year brackets non-fiction narrative close brackets at the 2022 british book awards it also inspired empire state of mind the acclaimed two-part documentary for Channel 4. We, on on our show, we used uh, extracts from both Satnam's book and from that documentary for our piece on museums. For full disclosure, I've known Satnam since we were 18. We went to college together. Um, I have studiously managed to avoid sincerity with him since we were 18 years old. The hardest thing for me to be sincere about is how much I love this book. I loved oh, it so much. Um, okay. you, you don't, Yeah, you don't want to hear that, and I won't say it again. <laughs> Um, but please welcome Satnam. Uh, he is with us now in London, I presume. I am. I'm in my kitchen, which is why it's a bit echoey, because I'm never cooking here. It's totally empty. Why Why would you pick the kitchen for this? Great Wi-Fi connection, basically. Oh, OK. Uh, yes. Obviously, okay. the imperial connections, curry, obviously, Worcestershire sauce, all that stuff. Yeah, that's right. That's what it is. That and Wi-Fi, just not necessarily at that order. So let's... Go straight in with what what compelled you to take this book on for a start? Because it's an enormous undertaking. One could say ludicrous undertaking to, to write a book of this scope um in a format that this is is this digestible. Uh yeah, it was completely accidental, as you as you probably know. The creative process is complicated and you on, often end up with something you didn't intend. And I actually was planning to write a biography of this guy called Dean Mohammed, who was the first Indian to ever come to Britain. He was a kind of a strange guy, set up the first ever curry house. Then he set up a massage parlor, and his clients included the king. Quite a weird life. Anyway, I thought I should find out about the historical context. Realized because of our education, if you remember, was so mm -hmm. poor when it came to empire that I knew nothing about British empire. So I just began researching it. And then I realized that lots of other people know absolutely nothing. And then Black Lives Matter happened, which suddenly made colonialism and, you know, structural racism, international subjects. And suddenly shows like yours were covering it. And so it was completely accidental. When I was writing it, my, my mates had no idea what I was trying to do. They were confused. Yeah, that's it. I, I want to kind of get into that straight away because this does seem like a very timely book, but it is striking the extent to which that was not the case when you were first writing it because you were writing this before the protest of uh, the summer of 2020 and before, um, uh, yeah, the Black Lives Matter and its right, the its ripple effects uh, moved around the world. You think about in Britain, we had the Edward Colston statue getting like you, you're still saying we, John, we've still got you. <laughs> I'm a dual citizen. I'm a dual citizen. I get to double we. I get <laughs> I, I get to slightly confusingly say we for everything. But yeah, the, when the Edward Colston statue came down, it it was uh inspiring and interesting to see young people seemingly suddenly getting context for a statue that they might have walked past possibly hundreds of times in their lives and maybe had the question, who is that? But only in getting a fuller answer regarding who that exactly is, uh, kind of understandably, it, it begged the follow-up question, well, why the f*** is that there? <laughs> and should it maybe not be in the river? Would that not be a better place for it? <laughs> it, it it's interesting the extent to which, a, generationally, we have just not had the context to understand necessarily some of those objects around us. Yeah, and actually, I've been, I went back to our old university, John, the other day, and, you know, our college had some notorious imperial bastards on display, and we didn't realize. You know, yeah, Jan what? 
Jan Smuts, the founder of a oh, yeah. South Africa. Yeah, yeah. There was a portrait of him above our dining table, and I had no idea. I, did you? I, I doubt I it. Did, I did. I <laughs> did know that the Jan Smuts. What I did know because I remember thinking, oh, alumni. They put Jan Smuts. You realize, without any asterisk of not a great one. <laughs> was, <laughs> he was in there with Charles Darwin. Like these, look, you know. They had an impact on the world. You think they did. That much is true, but you might want to articulate mm. a little more exactly what that impact was. Yeah, and Darwin's work obviously hijacked by racists everywhere. But it, yeah, it was quite weird. It's, this was something we never really thought about, you know, collectively. I remember nearly finishing the book and putting on the TV. I think it was lockdown. And on BBC One, there was a news item about, it's a lead item about how the racism in America can be explained by the racism of British Empire. And it mm -hmm. just blew my mind. I was like, oh my God, this is what I've been thinking about for two years. No one's been interested. And suddenly it's leading the news. So it was it's just it's quite a surreal thing when the thing in your head uh becomes internationally interesting. Yeah, I want I want to get to the connected tissue between um the US and Britain and between the, the American and the British reader of this book a little bit later. But I, did, I don't know if you found this too. In, in reading this book, I found myself both like constantly fascinated and furious that I was learning some of this information so late. Did you go through something similar? Because I found myself quite resentful looking back about uh, some lots of what I was taught, especially regarding British history which felt yeah. like, uh, yeah, somewhere between self-serving and just actively wrong. Yeah, I felt like that too. I felt it was weird. I'm writing a kid a kid's book about empire coming out in summer, and I feel really excited that they're going to have the knowledge that we didn't have until our 40s. Yeah, definitely. But at the same time, I hate those because I right. hate that they've got that power and that knowledge that we never had. I feel it's kind of version of <laughs> yeah. resentment about how we were taught nothing. It explains so much about our lives, you know, especially you know, I'm brown. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Empire. You wouldn't be there because America probably would, would be very different, wouldn't it, if it wasn't for yeah. British Empire. And yet, barely mentioned. And also, I, I just never thought about it. So I've got to blame myself as well, you know. Why that's, didn't I look into it? I guess that's true. I've thought about that as well. I and mean, I'm definitely... Right, uh, angry and like to some degree embarrassed that I, I didn't take it upon myself to correct some of this earlier. But some of the, some of those lessons are so abiding that you get taught early on. What one of the ones that was shattered the, almost the quickest in your book was that very nat lazy argument of you can't judge the past by the standards of today. Uh, it falls apart so quickly, so early in your book. That one yeah. raid, right, the the raid in northern Ethiopia, you talk about that one had an expert from the British Museum going along on that raid to kind of curate and uh, bid on some of the choicest items for them, which already feels uh, <laughs> like something I think we should have been taught. And then really crucially for me, having a prime minister in 1868 deeply lamenting that articles were thought to have been brought away by the British army. Kind of yeah. completely blew my mind because it, it demolishes that idea that this was just how things were at the time. There were people then at the highest office in Britain saying, hey, that shouldn't have happened. We should send those things back. Yeah, God, I mean, British Empire was resisted all the time. It's a proud British tradition, you know, complaining about empire. There was Gladstone, who you just mentioned. There was Queen Victoria sometimes complaining about the way in which some of her generals were behaving. You had H.G. Wells, George Orwell, E.M. Forster, even Churchill saying that Jolly and Wallabarg, the massacre, was, you know, monstrous. You know, this is really, really Winston Churchill. But um, I've been listening to a podcast uh, about Columbus, and actually what he did was complained about bitterly in, in Spain. The Queen was saying... Why are you enslaving all these people? And we need to remember this, that a lot of colonialism was resisted at the time. It's not like woke people like you and me are just making it up now. It's it's a proud yeah. European tradition to fight this stuff. That that was genuinely revelatory to me, though, because I think it is so often put in the context of, well, this is to, these are today's attitudes judging the attitudes of the past. And as soon as you realize that isn't true, it becomes a much more difficult conversation, much more nuanced conversation, and probably a much more valuable conversation to have. 
Yeah, totally. And actually, people like Richard Cobden, you know, he was the guy. He was massively, massively into the economic side of things. And but you know, he talked about India as being a career of spoilation and wrong. I mean, this is the language that probably even woke people wouldn't use today because it's a bit too much. <laughs> but it was happening then. And Gladstone, God, he railed against empire constantly, even though he then ended up colonizing stuff anyway. But that such was the kind of imperative to take over parts of the world. But yeah, I think it's a very important thing to remember. Especially because it feels like maybe one of the least the least things you could expect from a history lesson is maybe to be taught about most, if not all, of the genocides that your <laughs> country was responsible for. And to have gotten through an education in Britain without having known about the Tasmanian genocide feels like a monstrous flaw in that education, doesn't it? Yeah. You often hear people say, you know, British Empire, it wasn't like the Nazis. We didn't do genocide. And it's like... Right, exactly. Literally, the genocide that was used to develop international law on genocides was an imperial genocide, the Tasmanian genocide, right? Um, and now, depressingly, in Britain today, we have people denying that genocide. You know, we have people like Nigel Bigger, who's, you know, bigged up by the right-wing press, basically questioning whether it happened. And that's the level of the poor history, you know, that people are able to do that. That's what feels like it's at stake. And I think that's one of the many things I liked about this book so much is that it feels like if if we agree, and I don't feel sure that we do universally agree, that we are long overdue a conversation and a difficult conversation and a reckoning with our history and our histories, uh, it's hard to have that conversation if not enough people know what the f they're talking about. And I think that is genuinely the case and not always out of um, fault with people i think we have been let down to a large degree and it probably has to be a correction to that it's just it's a correction that's going to come in the face of some um protest isn't it yeah <laughs> in my experience people come to events about empire like talks i do they have one fact on empire and they just keep repeating it and that's what it's like the discussion is like they'll know oh actually africans were involved in slavery why don't you talk about that? And it's like, we need more than just one fact. Or we built the railways in India. That's a very common one. Uh, oh, that's railways. A... <laughs> you get that all the time. It is. I it, I hope I hope generationally that has gone away. It is hard to overstate the extent to which we built the railways was a major singular fact in our childhood education, isn't it? Yeah, I do remember yeah. being really being told that the railways were not there before and they were there <laughs> after we left and they're, they're pretty good. Yeah, you've been away from England for too long, John. I'm afraid to say the uh, railways argument is still very much alive. If you turn on the TV at 6.30, BBC Two, you're fit, there's a high chance you'll see Michael Portillo in red trousers on a, on a train in India talking about how we gave the railways to England, you know. Of course, we built the railways <laughs> to yeah, take yeah. stuff out of India, to move the armies around. <laughs> uh, we didn't allow the brown people to drive the trains. I mean, at one point, they were like, maybe we'll try the Sikhs. They seem OK. And they decided against it. They're like, actually, no, they're crap. They can't drive the trains. Um, and so they're a story of exploitation and racism, basically. And uh, still, we, we make these documentaries about... Yeah, G gave the railways is... Uh... That is using the passive voice to break your points, isn't it? <laughs> uh, I guess that in seeing some of those kids with um, uh, with the Colston statue, I guess the thing that's given me a little bit of hope, and you know, I don't generally operate on large amounts of hope in my daily life, but is that it does seem like younger people have more astute questions based on having access to slightly broader context of history. So yeah. it, they don't seem as dumb as we were when we were there. Yeah, age. yeah. No, there's absolutely, I think there's a new generation of people who, who they, they look at museums in the way that we looked at zoos. You know, we're like, why the hell are they trapping animals for? And they'll go to the British Museum and ask really awkward questions. Um, and also they're getting their information from outside the education network. Yes, so they, 
they're getting on Instagram, they're getting your books by a gala, you know, they're watching documentaries on YouTube and so on. And they're going to school and they're saying, tell me about this, teacher. Why, yeah. why aren't you telling me about colonialism? Because that's stuff that shapes my life. So teachers are having to come up with answers, even if the curriculum basically is crap and still doesn't really encourage people to learn about empire. What has the um, what has the response been to this book, both kind of both positive and negative? Because I'm guessing you've probably experienced the extremes a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I guess you know this too. But yeah, so I guess there's been the death threats and uh, uh, the shouting racism. Actually, one of the weirdest things on the negative side have been the people who come to my events, and so there'll always be one person, usually a man in his seventies, but not always white. Actually, sometimes an Indian who will stand up and say I'm a disgrace, that I should be ashamed of myself, that why don't I acknowledge the achievements of empire? I should be grateful. That's a big motif you get if you're brown. I should be grateful for what Britain's yeah. done for me. Right. And yet I'm criticising it. I mean, you say lots of neg- negative things about Britain. Um, occasionally you say nice things, but generally negative. But you don't get... How often do people say to you, I mean, let's... grateful? Less than you for reasons that are obvious, right? Yeah. <laughs> it wouldn't yeah, that 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 particular club in their bag isn't there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but on the positive side, and it's human nature not to focus on the positive, I guess. You yeah. know, I know teachers are using it to teach kids, which is such an amazing thing. I don't think any writer gets that about a year within publishing their book, it's being used by teachers. Yeah. Right. And we have sent out fifteen thousand copies to schools. Every day I got email emails from kids who are writing essays based on it. And it's not just that they're using my book. They're using my book to do their own reading. Yes. Which right. is what you want, right? Yeah. You don't want to kind of prescribe what people think. It's nice when people disagree with you. They, as long as they, you know, reply with actual facts, you know, which, which is the problem. A lot of histor- historical discourse involves fake facts and fake history. Also proves there's an appetite, right? A raging appetite for material like this because there's been a dearth of it. Certainly yeah, that yeah. people are commonly exposed to during educations like the ones that we had. Yeah, there is. Um, although, you know, even at Cambridge, um, they're now decolonizing some of their courses, which is it blows my mind. I mean, we didn't even know we were being colonized. I yeah, mean, for sure. That was one of the weirdest things. I don't think I read, I don't I think you probably did, read my first brown person in my final two terms at Cambridge, uh, Hanif Qureshi and Sam yeah. Rushdie. Yeah. And that was it, you know. And yeah. Um, But yeah, that is changing. And so kids are growing up empowered um, and, yeah, able to take these people on. How, I mean, how was the act? How was, how, has the act been of writing a children's version of Empire Land? Because it's, can't have been easy <laughs> no and actually i looked around and i tried to obviously find other books written for kids on empire and they they haven't been for decades the only one i found was horrible histories and i think they do amazing work yeah. making history accessible they did one book on british empire which you can't get and i i, I managed to get a copy and i realized why because there's quite terrible uh mistimed jokes about slavery and violence right. and right. It, I apparently got them into a lot of trouble. It's quite hard to get the tone right, right. with Empire because there's so many things you could get wrong. Um, and it's hard to explain something that's really complicated to kids. One mm-hmm. of the problems with, one of the reasons I think British Empire wasn't taught to us, it's just really complicated compared to World War II. Clear beginning, clear end, clear yes. length, clear morality, we were right. Um, whereas well, British Empire... No, no one agrees about when he started, when he ended. No one agrees about the morality. It was conflicting things at different times. You know, it's much easier to talk about the Tudors, Henry VIII, and World War One and World War Two. Yeah, what we do all the time, especially because it felt like the takeaways. I mean, the two things we really slowed down for from like when we were fourteen, fifteen, sixteen years old, learning history was. Uh, the Industrial Revolution, for which the takeaway was, it was difficult, but we did it. And then the First and the World War, to which the response was basically the same. Difficult, but we did it. Uh, and there is a, there's clearly an attraction in learning 
uh, about history where your country is perhaps superficially on the right side mm. of it and where the sense of good and bad is pretty binary. Um, but also yeah. all those things we, you mentioned, all of them have a colonial element. So there's a big academic uh, debate about whether the Industrial Revolution in Britain was financed by the money we made from slavery. Mm -hmm. uh, there was the imperial troops who fought in their millions in World War One and World War Two, And actually, even the Tudors, there were black people in Henry VII and Henry VIII's court. All those things I was never taught. So even when you're teaching those things, we always get, there was never any... British Empire, which is the biggest thing we ever did, just never gets mentioned. And it's quite a weird psychological thing. Yeah. It's incredible, isn't it? And I think that that's where some of my frustration has been in learning this late. Again, with both myself and with the way that I was educated in England, is that yeah, almost the largest fingerprint that your nation has is not something that you're given context for. I wonder if some of the uh, the pushback that you're getting, it feels like there is a wasn't it Boris Johnson? Didn't he talk about the defence of history, which feels like a utterly absurd concept yeah. to something which is supposed to be shifting as we understand it more yeah this whole this common thing about you must not rewrite history my favorite moment i don't know if you remember this but rishi sunak during his leadership campaign uh said that he wanted to refer people who did britain down people like you and me i guess to prevent the anti-terrorism agency and <laughs> wait what you know, he said what yeah, he was going to refer us to prevent. I'm still waiting for my appointment. But, yeah, he had to engage in the culture war. And so we've had this endless, oh, you know, woke people trying to rewrite history. That's what historians do. They, re mm. they rewrite history. And actually, the right-wing historians are especially keen on that. So people like Andrew Roberts, you know, has been complaining about people rewriting history. It's like, dude, your whole career is built on that. Um, but, yeah, it's been very depressing to see the government engage in this because... This is history that could actually make us understand our multiculturalism and our racism. And instead, they're just playing games and making it worse. That's a little of what I find saddening about the conversation around stuff like this, is that it feels like, in a narrow sense, there is uh, a general thirst for understanding more about your own past. You think about the popularity of shows like, in, well, in the America, it's finding your roots and uh in britain it's who do you think you are a slightly more passive aggressive <laughs> title uh but there is that sense of wanting to understand more about your past and therefore being able to understand yourself better which makes sense the moment you extrapolate that to understanding your country better it does seem like that's where some of the defenses go up yeah i guess a lot of people have family connections have you been invited to, onto any one of those shows and do have. you have any? Oh, have you? I, I, have, I haven't. I, I haven't done it yet. Partly because, oh, wow. um, part I don't know much about my family, but I, I would be. I, I'd love to find out more. Probably not, you know, on camera. <laughs> wow, you might have imperial connections. You might have slavers. I mean, it's family. almost impossible. I don't. Right. Well, there's, there's a fair chance. I, I would do it if I were you. I think that'd be very interesting. But that's the thing; they don't tell you about your family story until you go on it so right but even then that that act of wanting to examine where you've come from I, it's, it's just difficult to it you can't i guess decolonize or or, or depoliticize that process right because you're going to have to go back into moments of history that you don't understand enough of. there's a even with i had a friend who was given He's African American. He was given a twenty-three and Me test as a kind of, "Hey, here's a fun thing for you." And it was interesting having to explain to the person, you know, it's a little different, right? <laughs> a little when you give me this test, this isn't. Oh, I wonder if I'm fifteen percent Danish. It's wondering what acts of violence might have happened in your family's past. So, um, yeah, I mean, often when they're talking about mixed race relationships in that kind of family history, you're talking about rape. Right. You know, and, and people come up with these euphemisms, don't they? And there's all these euphemisms, the way British people talk about, you know, involved in Jamaican commerce or plantation owner. It's like, no, you were involved in the murder and torture of hundreds of people, your family were. And there's, but this euphemism 
tendency is more extreme in Britain, I think. It's what we're good at, right? Yeah. Let, let's talk a little about America uh, here, because you've you've written a um a note to the American reader in the new version of this, and this is as a British person, it helped me understand Britain significantly more than I had previously to reading this one book. Um, but uh, there's a nice bit of context that you write in here, just reaching out to the American reader, saying the contentional feeling that the War of Independence marked a total rejection of the British Empire is the historical equivalent of a teenager leaving home and declaring his parents had nothing to do with shaping him. He may not like it, and he may long to become his own person, and he may largely become so, but his parents still shaped him in all sorts of visible and invisible ways. I do think, as much as an American ear might bristle to that, I do think it's true, right, that there is right, yeah. so much that you can learn about uh, where America is and why it is where it is from the lessons of the past in Britain. Yeah, I mean, I think the USA likes to think of itself as an anti-colonial nation, right? Which is why I say at the beginning, you know, all the baddies in Hollywood films are played by Brits, mm -hmm. you know. Have you been offered any baddie roles? No, because I don't think I'm. <laughs> I don't think I'm ominous enough. I'm more. I'm not. You know, I wasn't Scar in The Lion King. I was Zazu. I'm more of a kind of a, a dispassionate narrator. Yeah. I don't. I don't have. I think the baddies in uh, are often upper class in British films. I'm from peasant stock, so it doesn't quite translate. Yeah, I can see you as a German Nazi who are also played by <laughs> British people. Confusingly, yes, that's this right. This is the idea because American. You know, can see itself. Uh, it doesn't see itself as a creation of British Empire, and it was. It was literally created by British people. The Puritans who came over were being persecuted by the English, but they were English. You know, and a lot of the stuff they brought over, the capitalism, you know, the judicial pro procedures, they were British. And I, I do think the U.S. War on Independence was actually a civil war between competing uh, British ideas. And then you got to remember that in in America, you know, they ended up there because of the transatlantic slave trade, which was at times dominated by the British. And a lot of the stuff they produced ended up in the imperial economy, in places like Liverpool, and yeah, being for sent sure. to India and so on. And, and if you, I'm working on a sequel to the book now, and I'm discovering that a lot of the leading politicians of America and Britain and South Africa and Australia, they were all writing letters to each other about white supremacy, about how to get rid of their brown populations, because there were Chinese people on the west coast of America, there were brown people in Australia, and Australia wanted to be white Australia. So you had people like Theodore Roosevelt writing to the Prime Minister of Australia saying, how did you get rid of those brown people? Because we might want to do the same. you know. And there was a kind of conspiracy of uh, white supremacy, um, which I'm not lo looking forward to tell British people about, because they struggle with the idea that British Empire was racist at all. You know, it's, it's it's something Britain, Britain does not want to hear. Yeah, I think that crosses over. There's a there was an amazing quote. Uh, I remember it was um, there was a conservative guy who he, he might have been talking to Christopher Rufo. I don't think Christopher Rufo said this. I don't know if you know of him. He's the guy that one of the one of the key figures behind the anti CRT push here in the US. But this guy who was talking to him said, "If you go to a public school in America funded by the taxpayer." You should come out thinking your country is great, which felt like a, I, I don't, and I believe that, that he feels that way, but it feels like an absolutely appalling thesis for an education to prepare you to live in the world, other than to prepare you to live in a fantasy world. And I don't doubt that would be a nice one to live in, but it doesn't really help you live in it with any kind of understanding. Yeah, the CRT thing is very strange because. I've tried to understand CRT and I've struggled because it's very complicated. If there's an eight-year-old in America who understands it, congratulations to that kid. Well, it's not, yeah, I mean, it's not being, yeah, it's not, it's a red herring, right? Because it's not being, it's, it's, it is immensely complicated and that's not what, I think it has just become now the catch-all term for the concept of learning about yeah, and, the nation's history in a way that might cause you to reflect. Yeah, but also, John, people say in Britain, people are like, say, oh my God, kids in Britain are being taught about CRT. And it's like, it's not. It's not yeah. even being taught in America, let alone in Britain, dude. But the, such is the fear, you know, and, but a part of that is that people don't want to hear that British Empire was for at least 100 years, 
proudly racist. And actually, Victorians would be very surprised to hear it claimed that empire wasn't racist because they were proud of it. You know, they saw themselves as the as the victorious race. What do you what do you think an American reader could benefit from in this book? I think I mean one of the main things is to realize that the way America developed was the way British Empire developed. If you think about it, you know the settler colonialism, you know in Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, it was the same. There was the same abuse of native people, the same residential school systems, the same reserve confinements. But then above that, obviously, I think the main thing is to understand the way racism worked because you know it was an international idea you know the enlightenment which led to slavery came about simultaneously in america in scotland and in germany all around the world people were writing letters to there were slight variations but essentially these ideas were international and they appeared at the same time and they explained lots of things around the world it wasn't just something that happened in britain but empire you know covered a quarter of the world and its influence has been profound you could say it's, it's had the biggest influence on global culture of any anything else. I think I can't think of anything that really, apart from maybe the internet, has influenced global culture in the way that British Empire has. Uh, again, an- another similarity here is that it does feel like museums are starting to be held here to uh, at least the beginning of a conversation about what they have either on display or crucially in storage uh, and um, what a process for repatriation could and should look like there. Uh, I'm guessing in England the same resistance is taking place. Is there, is there any advance on those conversations in Britain? Actually, there is, and you cover this in your show. You know, there's actually a, a weird thing going on. There's legislation which stops the national, big national museums from returning anything, basically. The British Museum, the VNA, and so on. But the smaller museums, like the uh, the one he had during the show, I think the University of Aberdeen Museum, the yeah. Manchester Museum, the also the the universities, and Jesus College Cambridge returning a load of Benin bronzes, they can do what they want. The local museums can do what they want. I see. So it's a complete twin thing going on where you've got the natural museums basically saying we can't return anything, and then you've got the smaller ones actually returning quite a lot and trying to engage. And I think what the local museums show is that actually we've got a lot to gain from talking about this because it makes us look less mad. I think the international conversation has moved on. It's moved on in America, moved on in Germany, in France. But in Britain, we're still stuck in this insane 1950s attitude. You can even make the case that the very act of repatriating some of these objects and explaining why you're doing that really speaks to the whole purpose of a museum anyway to help you understand the world through objects in it therefore you're learning about the object you're learning about the passage of that object to again use the passive voice the passage of that object to britain and back there's a lot to be said for that yeah actually in a lot of decolonizing things i mean britain the press always characterized decolonization as the deletion of great white texts shakespeare and so on but, you know, a lot of decolonizing stuff has been really interesting. I mean, Colston statue, yeah. which now I think is sitting in a gallery, art gallery on its back. You know, what a great exhibit. How interesting is that? It makes you think about so many things, makes you ask, ask questions. Whereas on the street, as you said earlier, it's just street furniture. No one notices it. Right. And so actually there's a lot to be gained intellectually. And I think if a lot of museums started uh, handing stuff back, it could lead to really amazing exhibitions, you know, international ones, great conversations, and it would make a lot of these exhibits, which are really boring, frankly, it make them. It will make them come alive. A lot of the stuff in British I, Museum is really boring. I, I hate to I hate to say it because again, I I'm, I'm allergic to optimism, but it does feel to me it, it feels like rose coloured glasses, but there is. There is such positivity in that the act, it, and it's I, it, so often decolonization is portrayed as a right an aggressive act where you're losing something rather than potentially gaining far, far, far more than you've lost, both yeah, in terms of education and in terms of you know moral conscience. Yeah, I think the word is terrible because it implies 
Yes, right. It's the deleting stuff, doesn't it? But it, what it is, it's a widening of the conversation. It's the widening of the curriculum. And if you use the word widening, everything suddenly sounds different. And I think a lot of academics are discovering, actually, it just makes the stuff a lot more interesting. I think you're right. It feels like, as a term, it's a right decolonization feels like an attack, which which is always going to provoke some kind of defense, right? And I think that's probably the problem that it uh, gets people into. Um, yeah, and the, and the problem with our education, uh, John, was that it was narrow. You know that it was really narrow, and yet we supposedly had one of the best educations in, in the world, right? And it was so narrow, and that was an academic failure. Leave aside the moral failure; it was an academic failure. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, I'm seeing some questions popping in to the chat. Are they all, all about your show? <laughs> <laughs> See, all your fans, they've been messaging me all day, man. That's right. Oh, really? I'm sorry about that. Uh, is there any, uh, here's a question, is there any strange similarity between this book and the 1619 Project? Yeah, there is. I mean, I think New York, what the New York Times is doing is amazing. And also it's depressing that we don't have something similar. Is that uh, true? Is there is there no parallel there? I've got to I say that, you know, I think the, we've got The Guardian, but, you know, what does the Guardian feels like a, a rather weak force nowadays, you know. Our press is much more dominated by the right-wing media, really. And uh, I think the New York Times is mighty, isn't it? I mean, it's doing very well uh, in terms of sales, and it's got the money to put into projects like that. Oh, you mean the Times? I, you know, I, I thought you meant like the 1619 Project itself. I was saying, is there, there, is there no oh, the New York Times. to that kind of to that kind of project in the UK? They are in, they are in do small projects, but they're nothing massive. Nothing massive. So well, are you basically well, British Nicole Hannah-Jones? Is that what this is? <laughs> yeah, I mean, this thing is, there's so many academics writing about this. I mean, I'm basically synthesizing their work, you know? Yeah. But they don't get coverage. They don't get any. And if they do get coverage, it's negative. You know, it's, oh, they're trying to shut down conversation. It's a culture wars kind of thing, right? That's right. I also think there is sometimes an issue. I think this is where the work that we do is has a little bit of cross fertilization. Is that uh, in those very academic books, it's often academics talking to other academics for the idea that this is a conversation happening in private and that the it happens slowly. It does seem like there's a real value in something like your book to basically having that aggregating some of what got from that conversation and having it with everybody. Um, yeah, actually, that's a very good point. I thought that historians would hate me for taking their work, but I do credit them routinely. Yeah, um, definitely. And, uh, but they've been really supportive. And I've, I've asked some of them, I was like, why, has, why haven't you guys written this book? And they were like, look, we're just focused on our niche, you know? Yeah. And we can't do the whole of Empire. It's too big, but someone else can look at all our work and put it together. I think that's right. I think that's what kind of, is, that was what was behind my first question, because it is kind of absurd to write one book about empire when you would think that there's like five books long books in the east india company alone but there really is a benefit i think to giving people an entry point to eventually those academics work if you want to go like you, you go through the bibliography is long in this book yeah yeah god i'm reading even more now at the moment it's, it's kill me but i mean I don't, I have until recently, I've not been a reader of history books. Have you? I mean, men tend to read history books in general, but I also find them too long. They assume a lot of knowledge, you know. Right. Um, but do you right. read much history? Uh, I'm not in the, I guess, in, this, in the classic cartoon version of a man reading a history book, it's normally about the Second and the First World War. And I actually think I might know enough about that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really... I don't really have particular interest in exactly how canons are made. Uh, it's the stuff that I wasn't taught that I've found, like you've found, that I found much more inspiring and genuinely exciting to read about because all of a sudden, like you say, you're having your mind broadened in a yeah. way that... Oh, have you know, helps. actually, Al Murray, a comedian, British comedian, I think he's written a book about World War Two, hasn't he? So, you know... I think there might be... Avenue book is book. open for you, John. Yeah, I know. I think it's... I think there's enough books about World War II. <laughs> I think I think there might be. Uh, uh, here's another question uh, from the chat. How do you respond? I guess we've talked a little on this. How do you respond to critiques that you <laughs> slash your book is anti-British? 
I mean, the you is let, let's let's do the book first, then we'll yeah. talk about you. <laughs> uh, yeah, I get this a lot. Um, uh, I, I, basically, it's like such a weird thing to you said this earlier about the idea of having to be proud of your history. It's like saying you've got to be proud of the sky or something. You know, of course, lots of weird shit in, in your history. Of course, there's going to be difficult things. Um, but I, this is part of the reason I, I mean, you said it's earlier, the use of the word we, I say we all the time in the book. And apparently, if you do a degree in history, one of the first things you get told is never to use the word we, because it's not you, right? Huh. But I can do it. That's way I can break the rule. And I actually think as a brown person, it's good for me to say we, because then it makes it less the idea, it makes it less that I'm kind of criticizing everyone else, all the white people who are doing terrible things, you know? It's, it's history that unites us. But it is a we, right? You're a child of immigrants, right? There's the yeah, broad yeah. we is applies there. Yeah, but I can also see the logic of never saying we, because, you know, I personally wasn't there when Clive of India colonized India, you know? Yes, right. But I think that is, again, why there is a real utility in not writing this with the kind of academic, the, exactly the same academic rules, because the moment you introduce we, you're kind of talking in a more colloquial way to people who, and and to your point, are you're not diving people in when they might need to have read three theses beforehand. You're meeting them where they are. And the brutal fact is where they are, where we are, is almost at square one when it comes to empire. Yeah. And actually, you know, having slagged off, uh, complained about my education and your education, I do think what a really good thing that it gave me, and I, su I suspect you, is critical analysis skills and being able to take a lot of very complicated information and digest it, you know, and not to be scared by academic books. That might be and true. So, yeah. So in a way, the point of education is to give you the skills to be able to teach yourself things. So I, I feel like I, we eventually got there, but maybe it shouldn't have taken 24 years after my degree. I think <laughs> that feels right. I think that's a very generous way to look at it. Also, I'm willing to, if, if at 18 year old, 18 year old, you're a bit of an idiot anyway. But yeah, you, that is a very generous interpretation of our education. Uh, uh, another question here, can you talk more about imperial amnesia? Oh, yeah, yeah, just for getting sh I mean, my favourite example of this is is Tony Blair in uh, in his autobiography. I don't know if you've ever read his autobiography. It's actually quite funny and good. Um, but at one point, he talks about handing Hong Kong back to the Chinese, which was in 1997, right in the middle of our degree, I think. Yeah, and, uh, I remember that, yeah. He Patton, says that... Right, Chris Patton was the governor there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chris Patton. Um, and he says... Oh, I was only dimly aware of the history for why we ended up with Hong Kong. And it's like, man, you, every single Chinese person knows why they lost Hong Kong. They know about the Opium War. They know Britain went to war to flog drugs to their country. you know. And yet, the Prime Minister of our country can hand back the colony and not know about the history. And I feel like this is almost routine. You know, it's like, it's reflected in our films, our, actually the, the fact that we don't make films about colonialism, you know? We mm -hmm. make so many films about World War One, World War Two. If we do make films about colonialism, it's that kind of sepia-tinted, you know, uh, glamorization of, of the Raj, isn't it? Yeah. A cool drink as the <laughs> sun sets over Delhi. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Nothing about the other 500 years or the other you know, third of the planet that we colonize. Almost nothing. Maybe Zulu. I mean, Jesus, that's not much good. Is right. It? I guess what's staggering to me about an admission like that is that the context in which I, I, I'm guessing from what you're saying that he's delivering it. it. It's kind of a throwaway comment. I didn't know much about it. Like, that's not a serious problem that deserves to be fixed. Yeah, that's, also, a, that's a damning admission. Not just, not yeah. just. It's, it's not. I mean, it's a little bit his fault, but uh, that is a damning indictment of the education he was given. 
Yeah, and actually I argue in the book that in Britain we have a tradition of being proud of not being too clever or fear of being too clever. So Rishi Sunak's being accused of being too clever. You know, David Cameron was being accused. I think he got accused. Boris Johnson accused David Cameron of being too clever. And like, it's a, it goes back to empire where, you know, lot, like the Sudan service picked out people from Oxbridge who had third class degrees, people who were really good at sport but didn't think too much. Because if you think too much, you might analyze the system and decide it's crap or wrong. You know, in British culture, I think there's a general uh, feeling that people who get stuff done and don't think too much are good. What was that? There was that staggering moment that Boris Johnson was on some trip abroad and he started muttering some Rudyard Kipling poem. Which one? Oh, which... Yes, yes. It's in oh. Myanmar. It was in Myanmar. That's right. And the uh, diplomat had to stop him from yeah. reciting it, but it was I think, on camera. Uh, yeah, I think he, he. I think he muttered something like "not here." As he said. <laughs> yeah, no, that wouldn't go down well. <laughs> yeah, but Boris is. You know, I, I read a biography about him, and he's actually quite smart. He speaks multiple languages, but he when he, yeah, he speaks speaks French on camera, it's in this kind of franglais. So he's acting like he's thicker than he is. Of course. Which is British culture, which I argue yep. is all about the empire. Everything's about empire, John. I hope you've gathered that. Yeah. Uh, was <laughs> uh, Here's uh, another one. Is there... Yeah, I guess, I guess we haven't talked specifically about examples here. Was there anything that surprised or shocked you during your research for this book? I guess... Yeah, in... I was really shocked by the violence, yeah. I mean, also people like Charles Dickens, like at the, after the mutiny, you know basically saying that every Indian needed to be killed because of what the Indians had done in rebelling. Um, the violence, yeah, you don't... I mean, I actually talked to historians who specialise on violence, and one of them said to me, look, you've got to not read that stuff after three o'clock in the afternoon, because if you do, you'll have nightmares about it. And there are stories about historians who research this stuff who, who end up suicidal. And it did... It, it's quite dark to read about the violence. And some of the images, like those British soldiers who wanted to take back heads as mementos. Yeah. So they ordered them on the battlefield and someone went off and chopped all the heads off and they boiled them in a cauldron to take the flesh off overnight, stirring them so that the heads looked like apples in soup. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that was what was so striking, not that it's the exact same example, but seeing you in a, the University of Aberdeen, basically with that holy man's skull in a box um was just a brutal moment i yeah, can't imagine what it actually feels like to have it presented in front of you well, i think you did a good thing also by hearing that because that that museum is now trying to repatriate a load of its human remains as a result of that program and um this is a great unsaid story i mean our museums are full of bodies yeah because of this weird Victorian race science. You know, they wanted to prove that brown people were shaped in a certain way, which explained their behavior. And so they collected all these human remains and our the British Museum vaults are full of them, but what are they gonna do with them? You know, are they ever gonna acknowledge how much stuff they have? And yeah, it's awkward to say the least. Uh, here's another question, I guess uh, a little more forward-looking, uh, how do you get politicians to be willing to engage or allow these conversations to go forward? I've given up on politicians because, you know what, I did think Labour could take on the Tories in this culture war, but they basically decided to stay away from it, like to do anything on museums or on any other subjects I'm, or, you know, try to teach empire would be to restart the culture war, which the Tories will win. Uh, that seems to be the view amongst Labour, and I can see why they've made that political calculation. It's very depressing that even the progressive political party in Britain is not willing to do anything. So where's, this. so where's your hope there? In educators? That they will Yeah, Yeah, I'm actually, you remember that a lot of academics, a lot of academies in Britain don't follow, actually none of them follow the national curriculum. Private schools don't follow the national curriculum. Uh, teachers who have students coming in saying, teach me about this, don't follow the national curriculum. So I feel like things are changing. And it also in Wales, it's become compulsory to teach uh, colonialism and slavery 
probably going to happen in Scotland. So basically, you're talking about a smaller and smaller group of English schools. And even, even the national curriculum has something about empire now. So I do think things are changing, and actually kids and teachers are going to change everything anyway. Yeah, I think America is actually facing a slightly different problem there. You think about it, it's going, it, it seems like it is going to become harder in certain places, especially Florida, for teachers to proactively, or or even in response to kids' questions, uh, talk about certain things without getting themselves in some level of legal exposure. Which is- yeah, I'm so depressed to read about that. And actually, I've been reading about how books are being banned now in America for schools. And it's like, oh, God. Because whatever happens in America happens here eventually. I'm just so, I, I'm almost dreading the day. I mean, oh, I've got kids coming out, a kids' book about empire coming out. So my fear is people will start that crap. But I feel like it's kind of bleak, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I just, it's some of it is part of a, is not a new conversation, right? It's that there's been back and forth with between parents and schools for decades over, hey, what's this book that you brought home? Some of that's not completely inappropriate. I think the problem is it's happening outside of that relationship between parents and teachers now, and it's community getting involved saying, I don't want kids in general being taught this thing. Um, yeah. Uh, is part of the political resistance to change to do with fear or guilt? I think even then you were saying some of it's just politically expedient, isn't it? Yeah, and in terms of the Tories, why are they why are they doing this? It's because they've calculated that, you know, there are voters in Britain who are economically left wing but socially right wing. They, you know, they're proud of the queen. They love the Queen, God bless her, her memory. <laughs> um, they, they they want to wave the flag. You know, and they they don't want Winston Churchill to be criticised, you know, but they're left-wing in other ways. And they think that the culture war plays well with them. I don't think it does. I'm from that part of the world in the Red War constituencies. Yeah. I don't think it plays well. And if you look at the surveys, I think three quarters of British people have no problem with this, any of it. It's actually a niche within a niche. It's a niche within the Conservative Party who just like it. It makes them feel great. And it's the same in America, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I think it, it, feel fantastic. I think it really does. Yeah, I, I think that and that feeling is real. I think that actual feeling is real, even though what it's built on is debatable. Um, how do you, here's another question. How do you explain Brexit in the context of your perspective, not just in general? Explain. <laughs> why, why did we do that? Yeah, why did we do that? Yeah. Um, we did it because uh, we ran the biggest empire in human history, and then we, in our minds, we were demoted to being a member of a club. And we had to take rules from other people. And psychologically, that was always difficult for us. And it's reflected in the language of Brexiteers, you know. When Brexit happened, um, I think it was either Nigel Farage or Boris Johnson saying, uh, you know, we've achieved this without a single shot being fired, which is the language of colonialism <laughs> and independence. And they, they, they made endless analogies to colonial times. But... Now they go, if you say this in the newspaper, they go mad and they say, only Remainers think that Brexit was a bad empire. I think it was, partly. Uh, Here's another one. Um, It is heartwarming to hear that you've known each other since you were 18. Okay. Uh, We're both still alive. Uh, Any funny (laughs) stories you can share about one another? We can skip over that one if you want. (laughs) Oh, there are a few, yeah. I remember, where, I just I remember the other day that we both entered an art, art exhibition. Do you remember this? Yeah, I, we did <laughs> because our friend, our friend's an actual artist. In fact, one of his pictures is over your shoulder there. Yeah, Lachlan Gowdy. Yes, and um, we decided it can't be that hard, so we'll enter too. And uh, yeah, I entered into the collage of George Michael pictures. I don't know what you did. <laughs> you didn't I remember what you did. about that. <laughs> you, you worked in the medium of collage. Yeah, basically. I, I can't remember. Know, my my coaster for my drink is a is a Wham album. So um, representing. How uh how do you persuade people to stop taking criticism of that country's history personally? Oh God, I don't know. I mean, they need therapy, don't they? That's the thing. Oh, well, I guess. I mean, you to a certain extent, yeah. But I guess, like, the, again, the literal definition of therapy is that you're supposed to like, look within yourself to get better, right? It's supposed it's a painful act, but it's supposed to imp- 
improve your life in material ways. I guess that, <laughs> I guess I would try, personally, I would try and sell it as a positive, not a negative, which is difficult, right? And I think, I think you hit on something with sometimes the terminology not being ideal. Decolonization feels like subtraction, yeah. not what actually is addition in a way. Yeah, we don't have to view our family history or our country's history through the prism of pride or shame. You can just try to understand it. Yeah. It doesn't seem that radical idea, but some people really struggle with that. Um, here's another one. Since you've written a book and a documentary, is there any difference on how you tell a story or get your message across to a reader versus a viewer? Well, that's a very good... I mean, as you know, uh, John, TV is a bit more basic. Although, you know, I think you're at the, hey! the most... Hey! <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was going to say you're at the most intelligent end of TV, aren't you? Oh, <laughs> sure, yeah. But you've already said the medium I work within is basic, so you're yeah. really putting a huge asterisk on that. It's compliment. Powerful though, it's like I think that in one minute of TV you can have maybe two ideas. In books, you can have like ten ideas on one page. That is of but course equally. True. People might fall asleep while they're reading your book. They're less likely to fall asleep while they're watching TV. It's just yeah, I guess, and I, I guess. In terms of the, um, when we did our piece on museums, I guess in terms of the food chain there, I guess I was keen for people to read your book. So it feels like if we can send people to your book and you can send people to your book's bibliography, it feels like <laughs> they will get to some rigorous academia at the bottom of that process. Exactly. But actually, I, I think there's, the... more, there's the, more work is actually done in TV. There's more people involved, more research is done, the amount of material sifted through. It's, it's, a, it's a great skill to make complicated subjects accessible. It's much harder than writing a very complicated book, isn't it? And TV is, is about communication, isn't it? And it, it's the reason why it attracts the most intelligent people, you know, because it involves a lot of brain power. Also, there is something very striking as well. It, even I, I think I would have felt this not knowing you, but seeing you and Aberdeen confronted with the head of a human being feels like you are at the sharp end of this that, that it is one thing to read those acts of violence on a page and it is not easy to read it's another thing to witness someone's face looking into a box thankfully that you can't see inside there <laughs> um yeah i yeah. guess i've realized that actually you, using yourself you know is actually a very powerful thing to tell stories through your own life i used to think it was like a failing I, I write so much about my right. my own story because um, I wrote a memoir quite when I was quite young. Um, but actually, that was a memoir about schizophrenia, like a really difficult subject. Mm -hmm. And I hope people picked it up and learned something they probably wouldn't normally have picked up a book about. And I hopefully something similar is being done with Empire Land. You know, people are picking it up and learning stuff they wouldn't necessarily want to learn about. Yeah, I think it helped to start reading it through your eyes as a reader as well uh, because you're meeting people where they are and where they are is almost entry level education when it comes to empire but i i, I think it 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 is uh it's easier to onboard people i think knowing that you're meeting them saying hey i didn't know either let's let me walk you through what i've just learned from the research it, it, it's very hard to admit ignorance in a book it's hard to get it right isn't it i mean i it could have gone. It could have backfired massively. Frankly, let's face it. You know, you, I think you're. I don't know about it. I think you're ignorant. Like, why am I reading this? Really well, so don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, can you share what the best piece of professional advice that you received uh, was, and who was it from? Oh my god. Um, I don't know if it, who gave me this advice. It's advice I gave myself. But when people are criticizing you viciously or even praising you lavishly, it's almost never about you. Mm. It's about them. And so don't worry about it. What about you, John? You must have had some professional Honestly, I, the, the, <laughs> most, the most visceral end of that for me is, is hecklers doing stand-up. I remember, especially starting off, there was one guy in, um, in Edinburgh at a late-night gig, and he was so angry with me. And it was like 2 in the morning. It was the show Late and Live, and he broke a glass on his table, and he said, if you don't leave the stage now, I'm going to kill you. I remember giggling, because I do remember even at that moment thinking, this can't be about me. <laughs> I don't think, 
I don't think everything's been going fine. And then, then I walked out here. I don't think that's what this is. So I'm not going to, I'm going to choose not to take this personally and I'm going to stay. <laughs> I think you're right. I think it wasn't about you, John. <laughs> um, is there, where we go? Oh, uh, uh, Satnam, is there an issue person? Oh, this is about me that you wish John would cover on his show. Uh, you know, I, I wanted to ask you a question, John. Would what? you write a book? Uh, I think you should. Maybe one day. I think I've this. I don't just as much as I find your interpretation of the medium for TV massively insulting. I actually don't disagree with it. But it's I I have. I think what's very fun for us is working within this more restrictive medium to try and give people as much depth as you can in mm. what is that sometimes 30 plus minutes where we talk about one story each. um but you have and, got to, i hate to remind you you have got a degree in english literature yes yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, i should be able to write a book right i'm choosing not yeah. to you've read um, some I, I i think we i think we've used our show it's similar to where you, you you've used this book right to try and send people off on other um exploratory missions so that you can read more that, that that's why you you put the big bibliography in or footnotes that's why we, over my shoulder is constant sourcing partly just so you can fact checkers but also you, you go and read this yeah you're the only show on tv that has footnotes i find that amazing. <laughs> that's so, incredible yeah it's been to a success yeah the footnotes <laughs> of tv that is both a compliment and a legitimate criticism of this show um i think we're getting close to time here. yeah well thanks john i appreciate you're making your new series are you like a quarter of the way through no not we're three Just shows we've got 30 we're, we're literally oh, wow we're literally not a quarter we're 10 percent. oh thanks for taking the time out because i know i feel like in some ways our lives haven't changed because it's a, Essentially, we 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 just have a weekly essay crisis. Yours is on American TV. That is exactly right. Yeah. God. Mine is slightly more lowly, but it's the same. We're living the same lives. I it is definitely comes from the same feeling. God, it's bleak to think about. I thought I'd grown more as a person, but I think I've just <laughs> I've just changed what that essay crisis is about, and it's not about something fundamentally that different. I will say though, I'm more interested now than i was then i think some of that is that hmm. you become more curious as you get older but i oh, do definitely God. i do think what i loved so much about this book is that i wish i'd had it when i was younger well thank you i also wish i had it when i was younger i think yeah. i would have been a different person i think we would we would have had very different conversations when we knew each other as well i think but... that's i think that's true and it i think that's true I, which is a shame, but I guess hopefully 18-year-olds now have access to this kind of stuff and have different conversations than the ones that we did, which were about they couldn't they they could have still been about wham occasionally, but it could just could have been about other things as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, my hope is that you know people or kids reading this book will write something significantly better, uh, you know, and also showing that I'm wrong about a bunch of stuff. You know, oh. that would be that would be success. Final, final question just came in. Favorite Wham song? Oh, right. Everything she wants, probably. I don't actually listen to Wham. It's just become a thing. I feel like I have to keep going, <laughs> keeping because yeah, people right. expect me to. So, uh, yeah, but everything she wants. That's, I, I always knew that the last question in a conversation about Empire was going to be favorite Wham song. <laughs> uh, let me bring out the uh, final. Uh, Final part of the wrap-up script here. Closing, yes. Our thanks to Satnam Sangira, author the of Empire Land. Link. <laughs> How imperialism has shaped modern Britain for joining us today. We encourage everyone to pick up a copy of Satnam's book at your local bookstore. I really do encourage people to do that. I know that, like in these, uh, in the the rhythm of late night show hosts, often there's kind of oh, you, people should buy your book or watch your film. I was never good at that stuff, even when I sat in for John Stewart. I I cannot tell you how much I, I'm gonna, literally going to cover up your face on the screen, Sat. I'm sorry, I have to look at your face. I can't tell you how much I enjoyed this book. This is uh, I would recommend this to anybody. All right now, there you are. Um, if you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making virtual and in-person programming, please visit commonwealthclub.org 
slash events. And then it just says, I'm John Oliver. John Oliver, thank you and take care. Take care. That's a very generous, it's a nice thing to say at the end of that. Um, but thanks very much, Adam, for uh, speaking to everybody. No, oh, thank you for your time, John. I really appreciate it. I appreciate your support. So now we have to look aw awkwardly into the camera yeah. while, while this ends. We were explicitly told that we needed to look for two seconds in silence into the camera at the end. So that's what's going to happen now. I'll count you down. Five, four, three, two, one.